Gracious God, we bring you the broken parts of ourselves. Hem us in before and behind. Creator God, we bring you the joyful parts of ourselves. Weave us together in hope and praise. God of new life, we bring you doubt and faith knotted up in our hearts. Unravel our doubt, weave faith into our hearts. Draw us together and point us toward you. In hope and faith we pray, in hope and faith we worship. Amen. Join me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, light of the minds that you know, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, Help us to know you that we may, that we may truly love you. So to love you that we may, we may fully serve you, whose service is perfect freedom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the uni unity of Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Not to have our worst confirmed, 
but to have our best liberated. We pray for God's grace and pardon, not to be weighed down by guilt, but that we may live more fully into the images of God that we were created to be. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. God of unexpected joy and answered prayers, we confess that sometimes things feel too good to be true, while at other times we wonder if you hear us at all. When life unravels for the worst, we blame you. But when life unravels for the best, filling our days with holy surprise, we tend to praise ourselves, thinking we've earned this unexpected joy. Forgive us, help us to see you in our midst, and with every breath that turns into a laugh, draw us closer to you. Amen. I invite you now to remember the sound of your baptism, knowing that God's grace meets us here beyond our understanding. The grace of God is here for each and every one of us, no matter who we are, or where we have come from, what we have done, and what we haven't. May you know that grace deep within you, surprising you at every turn. You are forgiven and you are made new. Thanks be to God. Amen. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. In the spirit of that grace, I invite you now to share the peace of Christ with one another. You will need to unmute yourself to do that, and I invite you now to share the peace of Christ in the chat and also with your voices. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also, and also, also with, with you. you. With you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 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 Peace Peace Christ, Christ, everyone. Ah, uh, Taylor is rendered mute. Oh dear. <laughs> ah. Peace to y'all. Want to say hi to guests? Peace be with you. Here he is. Peace, Sarah. Hi. Peace, Grandma. Peace, Barbara. Peace. 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 There's the scripts. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Bless you. <laughs> Peace be with you, Augie. Peace, Julie. Good morning, Sally. Peace. And Peace. Hi, Taylor and Tom. Peace. Hi, Peace. Peace. Peace, everybody. Peace. Peace. Rich. Rich. Peace. Hey, Rich Nolf. And now, Peace be with you. Hey. Andy and Betsy together in California. Yes. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace. Peace, Eldon, Bonnie. Hey, Andrew, peace be with you. Peace, Rosalie. I'm
Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Worship at Brown this morning. My name is Michelle Ward, and I am delighted that you are here with us today. If you are visiting for the first time, I encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat window so we can all say welcome to you. And as you have no doubt seen, we have muted everyone for most of worship, and we will give you the power to unmute yourself at different points in the service, just like we did for the passing of the peace. So you can unmute yourself now for passing of the peace, and then we'll also unmute during the Lord's Prayer, and we'll be inviting prayers later in the service in the chat window. It's the last Sunday of the month, which means it's a candle lighting Sunday during the prayers of the people. So if you would like to light candles during that time, I invite you to also gather three candles together to have for the three different portions of the prayer that we will pray together. We are continuing our sermon series today, Unraveled, Seeking God When Our Plans Fall Apart. We invite you to reflect with us about the ways in which God is working through these unpredictable times. I wanted to alert you all again that we are continuing our Loving Your Neighbor during COVID-19 volunteering throughout the community. And we've compiled a list of service opportunities into a single document. And we're going to drop that in the chat now. So I invite you to click on that to see where you might be able to help. And if you have an opportunity to add to our list, please email Sharon Holly with the details. You can see at the top of the list, there's a suggested action of the week. And this week, our serving opportunity is the Samaritan community, which is housed at Memorial Episcopal across the street from Brown. And they are still continuing to deliver groceries to families and individuals in need. The most needed items are shelf-stable groceries. And you can drop those items off on Mondays and Thursdays between 11 and 1. You can contact Sharon, the program director there, for more information. And you can find her contact info in the link that Andrew just put in the chat. I also wanted to remind you that we are still gathering for virtual lemonade and cookies after worship during the summer. So please stay for a breakout room shortly after the postlude, where we will place you into conversation groups so we can chat and enjoy each other's company a little bit longer. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, I will be volunteering at Rock Rose Farm with members of the church to harvest produce for our neighbors in Baltimore City who are food insecure. So if you would like to join me for that, you can find the link to sign up for that in the document that Andrew just put in the chat. This week, we also have a Wednesday morning Bible study and we are continuing to read Mary Magdalene's book called Mary Magdalene Revealed, The First Apostle, Her Feminist Gospel, and the Christianity We Haven't Tried. So if you'd like to join for the Bible study or for the prayer service, you can find links to those in the calendar on the church website. And if you missed the book group last month, um, earlier, there's still another book that we're reading for July called Being Mortal. If you'd like to read that book, the group doesn't meet until July 9th, so get a copy now at your local bookstore if you would like to join for that book discussion. I would like to lift up prayers of sympathy for Anne Heisler, whose sister-in-law Betsy died recently. Prayers of support for Barbara Klippinger, who moved to assisted living. And prayers for Nancy Webb, who is in the process of a move as well. As we mentioned last week, we are also lifting up Aaron Winkler and his family. Aaron has received a fellowship from Stanford University and has moved to California. Aaron was a member of our Chancel Choir and Soulful Review, and we thank Aaron and his family for all that they've given to Brown Memorial, and we thank him for being one of our readers at worship today. And now I'd like to invite the children and whatever puppet or stuffed animal friend they have with them to come forward to their screens to meet with Pastor Andrew. <laughs> Isabella, what's so funny? <laughs> I really shouldn't tell you. You would be upset. I would? Listen, I was watching 
watching a comedian, but he was making fun of songs he grew up with in his church. And I know it's not good to laugh at church. Try me. He sang like this. The bread of bread is bread. <laughs> Bring us bread. No one but the one from Jericho can bring bread to bread. Oh, I love that John Mulaney one so much. You love that one? But it's making fun of like your whole life. <laughs> yes, but you know, sometimes church is funny because. We are human beings. Sometimes, especially when we're being really serious and taking ourselves really seriously, sometimes that's when things are the most funny. I'm so relieved. <laughs> I'm not the only one who laughs at church. <laughs> you know, in today's story from the Bible, God comes to a 90-year-old woman and tells her that she's going to have a baby. And guess what? She laughs. I don't know what it's like to be 90, but I think I would laugh too. <laughs> I think God probably wanted us all to laugh at that part of the story. Laughter is a good thing. Did you know that it's actually good for your body, for your spirit, and for your soul? So keep on laughing, Isabella. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your gift of laughter and help us to not always take ourselves so seriously. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Mother of wisdom, mother of all wisdom, and father of surprise, let your thoughts, your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor are your ways our ways. Where we are closed, open us with your word, that we may truly understand that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow your way in all faithfulness seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Amen. The first scripture reading comes from the book of Genesis. Listen now for the word of God. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet. And rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on I like you. to your servant. So they said, Do, Do as, as you have said. said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. 
Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where Where is your wife wife Sarah? Sarah? There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. Oh, yes, oh, yes you, you did, did laugh. laugh. <laughs> Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
The second scripture reading comes from the book of Genesis and is a continuation of the first reading. Listen now for a word from God. The Lord dealt with Sarah as the Lord had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham, a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God. Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As part of our training, many Presbyterian clergy have to complete a unit of clinical pastoral education, CPE for short, which for most of us means a short stint as a hospital chaplain. It's in those hospital rooms that pastors in training wrestle with our identity as clergy, seeking to be present to people, often in painful transitional times, while navigating all the assumptions that people of all walks of life bring to clergy, faith, suffering, life, and God. As a young chaplain, I was turned loose on patients at Grady Memorial Hospital in, in Atlanta, the largest public hospital in the state, and later at a Catholic hospital in the outskirts of the city. Every two weeks, CPE students were required to meet in a small group led by an experienced supervisor. Over the course of study, each student had to present what's called a verbatim. That is a word for word conversation with a patient transcribed by memory from the chaplain who made the visit. For one of my verbatims, I chose a particularly challenging conversation with a patient in her 80s who was accompanied by her husband. I remember the salty negative comments directed by her toward her husband. Each time she expressed her anger, I did my best to inquire about what lay beneath. And each time I pressed her, she turned pleasant, even playful with me, deflecting my questions, choosing instead more personal banter. The conversation went on like this for a full 30 minutes. Anger and bitterness toward her husband, followed by levity, deflection, even jovialness with me. I finally gave up and moved on to the next room. And that day in the supervisory group, I asked for help. In the wake of my presentation, the supervisor had the look of someone who is clearly dealing with a green, naive member of the clergy. She's obviously flirting with you, she said directly. My face flushed. She's like 80 years old, I stammered, and she's married. How could she be flirting with me? My supervisor studied me for the longest time. Let's talk about your assumptions about old people, she said finally. Well, I have never underestimated older adults again. You would have thought that my biblical training would have given me all the wisdom that I ever needed. So many of these early biblical stories are about old people, and I mean really old people. Noah was 600 years old before he built the ark. 
just before he got sloppy drunk in front of his shocked adult children, which seems really reasonable after what he'd been through with the flooding of the world and all. Joseph was 110 before he died. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist and strong support to Mary, was described as, quote, getting on in years when she first gave birth. Anna was 84 when she blessed the baby Jesus and proclaimed him Messiah. <clears throat> Abraham was at least 100 and Sarah 90 years old when these strangers let them know they would be having a child. Centering senior citizens in the biblical story is kind of a weird move, if you ask me, since according to Atul Gawande, author of the book Being Mortal, over the 100,000 years that humanity has been in existence, it's only been in the last 200 years that the median age has moved out of the 30s. Up until that time, most people were dead before 40. That makes Noah and Joseph and Elizabeth and Anna and Abraham and Sarah outliers. But it certainly explains why Sarah laughs. Strangers show up and deliver the news that you are going to have a baby at age 90. You would laugh too. Reinhold Niebuhr in an essay on humor and faith points out that humor is an important way that humans process incongruities in reality. The incongruities between our self-confident, independent veneers and the reality of our vulnerable dying selves. So someone dignified slips and falls and we chuckle because of the incongruity between the image of that person and the actual situation that befalls them. Humor then serves us well as a coping strategy, a way to let us see ourselves from the outside of our particular absurd realities. It's a guard against taking ourselves too seriously. But Niebuhr argued that when this kind of humor is extrapolated out to the ultimate things in life, that then life itself either becomes a bad joke, an absurdity, or something that has meaning only in the presence of God. Sarah's laughter is evidence of the incongruity between the reality of being a 90-year-old woman and the news announcement that she will birth a child. But the announcement itself is God's own kind of joke. The incongruity between the predictable life that we expect in a world that assumes there is no God and the actual unpredictability of life that is lived in the presence of a God who does things like surprising the elderly with new and ridiculous assignments. God has the last laugh and Sarah and Abraham have to learn to go with it. And go with it they do. In fact, I wonder if Sarah's humor is precisely the kind of gift that enabled her and Abraham to adapt to their new circumstances. That's the kind of wisdom that older adults have often taught me. The wisdom of learning how to laugh as best we can at the absurdity of our situation. The fact that we are all going to grow old and die, the ultimate absurdity. And so better to mine that experience for the laughter it brings rather than bemoan that which we cannot change. Not every older person learns that, of course. Humor doesn't come automatically with age. But while life seems to be hard and tragic for those without it, humor seems to accompany those who have learned to live a joyful life in the face of the reality of our coming death. It may be the only way to face that essential tragedy that our lives are temporary with a different kind of joyous expectation. Anyway, the church would be a terrible place without the elderly, including because of the humor that in my experience they bring to our human condition. Don't let aging get you down, someone once told me. It's too hard to get back up. <laughs> Lots of older adults have shared with me the same sense of humor that gave them life, even facing the absurdities that come with old age. And so one of our members, Joy Price, invited me to happy hour with her friends at her retirement home. It will be more fun that way, she said, 
and I can show you off to, to all the old people, she laughed with a wink. And Catherine Marshall, who made it to Abraham level age, told me one time with a laugh that growing old isn't for sissies. I wish my church deacon David Rollinson would come and pick me up under the arms and throw me in his, in his truck and get me out of this place, she told me one time. I want to go for a drive and get myself a coat. When Jane Swope and I met to plan her funeral long before she died, she told me, Andrew, keep it short. I don't want people there all day. They have more important things to do. Mary Walker told me something similar when planning her service. I don't want it to go long, she said, resisting my suggestion that we sing all the stanzas of each hymn instead of just verses one through four. If they don't know this old girl by now, she told me, They've got no business being at my service. And Marion Bascom used to poke fun at all the pomp and circumstance of his fellow clergy in a way that reminded us that beneath all of our regalia, underneath all of our fancy, fancy titles, we are all just children of God. They could laugh some instead of crying all the time at the tragedy of our decline because they knew that their humor had come to them honestly from the Holy One of Israel. If God can say to a nearly centurion couple, people who are more prone than any other age group of being settled in their ways, that you are going to have a baby, then God can surprise any one of us with life-altering blessing. I think that's important to remember in these rapidly changing circumstances that we find ourselves in and in the hard work of racial truth telling that is the precursor for any kind of justice and healing. The blessing God is out there in the field, sneaking up on even the most settled of us with serendipitous surprises. Like the promise of Isaac, those blessings sometimes come with a lot of turmoil, a lot of new assignments, a lot of headaches. Could you imagine changing diapers at 3 a.m. in the morning as a 90-year-old? But that newness is the joy that is part of life lived in the presence of God. Just as I once underestimated that elderly woman in the hospital, so God is, not, is determined not to be underestimated in just what she is capable of bringing about in your life and mine. Humor, for some, may sound like a luxury they cannot afford in these fraught times. I think I used to think that way. But more and more, I think about humor as resistance to a culture that is always trying to commodify us. Just as Sabbath keeping for the Jews formed a kind of resistance to the slavery of Egypt that valued them only for what they could produce. So humor becomes the way that we resist the culture that would have us always judging and fearing our neighbors. We laugh at ourselves to remind us that not only are we fallible, inconsistent human beings, but we don't have to fear or loathe ourselves or others for being this way. We can see each other in all of our foibles, cultivating a life of honesty with ourselves and others, which is the basis for all relationship. Community organizing teaches that one of the essential qualities of a leader is anger, that deep-seated rejection of injustice at the level of my gut. Organizers look for that anger because it's the fire that sustains people in the face of opposition in the long-term struggles for change. But often overlooked is another essential quality that organizers look for in those same leaders, humor, that ability to not take ourselves too seriously, especially when answering the call to join the struggle that ability to stand outside of ourselves, face our mistakes and not be destroyed by them. That quality that leads us to the balance between accepting God's assignments that come to us and knowing that only through God's provision can we accomplish them. Sarah laughs. 
perhaps her reaction was the quality that made her perfect for this assignment. The quality that God knew would be necessary in order for an old woman to fulfill this ridiculous and difficult and critical assignment. Perhaps it's a quality that all people of faith need in a world that resists doing better, even when we are desperate for it. The quality that sustains struggle and faith over the long haul, letting those fires for justice burn within us without burning us out. Sarah named her son Isaac, he who laughs, because she said, God has brought laughter to me. She knew the sustaining power of this healing gift. May we learn it too in the belly laughs that sustain our faith and lead us to it. Amen. I wanted once again to thank you all for your generosity during this season of COVID-19. We are continuing to support our community partners through your generosity. And one of the partners we are supporting currently is the Farm to Stoop Project, 
which is supporting a local black owned farm, three part harmony farm and bringing their produce straight to central Baltimore community members who live on North Avenue or live in Station North. So thank you for your support. You can find other ways to support either through financial giving or through um, your continued work with um, various partners in the link that Andrew shared earlier, as well as with um, your financial gifts, which we will then distribute to our various partners. Without your generosity, we could not be the church and the church could not be what we are without your generosity. So thank you for your gifts and your time and your skills during this unprecedented and unknown season. The offering will now be received.
And please join me now and lift your hearts in the prayer of dedication. Holy and loving God, you bring us joy in unexpected ways and you are with us in these times of distancing and illness. And we ask that you steward these gifts, that we may live out your generosity and your justice in our community and in the world. In your name we pray, amen. We are continuing in prayer now with the prayers of the people. And like I said earlier, it is our last Sunday of the month, which means that we pray typically using candles in the sanctuary. So if you have not already done so, I encourage you now to go and find three candles to light for the three movements of this prayer. Please join your hearts with me in prayer. God, we come to you again with the sorrows of our hearts, knowing that you will never turn away from us. You did not turn away from Sarah in her pain when she could not conceive. You did not turn away from Hagar in the wilderness when she was cast out and sent to wander. You alone see these women, our ancestors, and you know their sorrow. Today you meet us in our sorrow, and now I invite you to lift your prayers of lament using your chat window. God, bring comfort to all we have named, and also for all the unnamed who are grieving this day. God, we too come to you perplexed and surprised, confused and uncertain, searching for you in the wilderness of our lives, desperate for healing, healing in ourselves, in our city, in our country, and in our world. Guide us to your joy, the only joy that lasts, that we might never be bitter again. We now lift our prayers for healing and guidance and discernment. Lord, 
Lord, take our prayers for help and guidance and healing and turn our sorrow into laughter, our mourning into dancing. Surprising God, you are merciful and kind, and we give thanks that you care for us. You hear us when we bring our burdens and mistakes of all kinds to you, and you hold each of us with patience and love. Whether we hide from you behind a tent like Sarah, or cry out to you in the wilderness like Hagar, you hear us. You turn our sorrow into laughter and cure our loneliness with your presence. We give thanks that you have not given up on us and that indeed nothing can separate us from your love. We give thanks that even in our broken world, there is still so much to thank you for. So hear us now as we share our thanks and praise to you, O oh God. and keep me. God, be the prayer to move my voice. God, be the strength to now uphold me. Oh, Christ, surround me. Oh, Christ, surround With a grateful heart, we lift our voices as one, far and wide, praying in the spirit your child taught us, saying, Our Maker, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, this day our daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us, us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, leave this place now, remembering that humor is a gift from God. That gift that displaces ourselves from the center and helps us receive ourselves and others with the grace that is needed to pursue God's justice together. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you and between you this day and every day of your gifted life. Amen.